He just, he just needs our obedience. And he needs our faith. But our faith is in him, not our ability. So I'm, I've probably told this before here. I've told it several times around the country. But, you know, one of the first times I went to Washington, D.C., I felt this prayer assignment on me. And it was so big. And it was just so beyond where I was. And I thought, God, you know, you know have, get Leonard Ravenhill in here or somebody that... They, I, this is 25, 30 years ago. And I just knew it was on me. I had to do this. And I, I was in a service, and I was going to do it publicly, some, some decrees and prayers and statements. And I remember I was st- still in the front row, and I, just, I was so tormented. And I said, Lord, I'm going to try my best not to mess this up. Please help me not to mess this up. You know what he said to me? He said, son, you'd have to try real hard to mess this up. <laughs> you just get up there and give it your best shot to the best of your ability. Say what I told you to say and do it. Because I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. I don't need you to say it perfectly. I don't need you to say it at just the right volume. I don't need you to choose the right words. I just need you to get up there and to the best of your ability. Tell them what I said and pray it and declare it. I'll take care of the rest. See, that's, that's being part of a company that has grace lavished on us to make us well-pleasing to him. And we become one with him. So we do it out of a heart that we just want to please him. And he said, just do it. Just do it. It's just do it. I'll take care of the rest. It's my kingdom. And I know what I'm doing. That was one of the most important words he ever gave me. It broke the performance thing off of me. It broke the fear of failure. It put the emphasis back where it needed to be. This is not about how good I am at doing it. It's, it's just willing and obedient to eat the fruit good of the land. With reverence and godly fear. And you know, there are three words in the New Testament for fear. So often, if you don't know which one of those words are used, you don't really know what God's saying. For example, he hasn't given us a spirit of fear. That's not phobos or phobia. It's a word that means timidity, insecurity. That's why he follows up with you giving a spirit of power and love because love overcomes insecurity and that timid thing. It's the word Jesus used in the boat. He used to think when he looked at disciples after they said, we're going to sink if you don't do something. And so he stood up and rebuked the storm. And then he looked at them and said, why were you afraid? I said, go on. They probably just looked at him sometimes like, what kind of a crazy question is that? Why are you afraid? I mean, those guys made their living out on that lake and had for, for decades. If they said this storm is so bad, if something doesn't happen, we're going to die out here, then they were going to die out there if something didn't happen. Absolutely. Anybody in their right mind would know why they were afraid. But he didn't say, why are you full boss? He said, why are you, Dalia, timid? Why were you timid? In other words, this is a demonic storm. I told you we're going to the other side. Now, the, now demons send this storm, and we know that because 
he, when he rebuked the storm, it's the word that's used when he rebuked demons. So he said, he didn't say, why were you afraid? He said, why were you timid? In other words, translation or interpretation, you should have done what I did. Don't be timid when these demons rise up and try to destroy you. Rebuke them. So that, that, that's just a little side. He didn't say in this <clears throat> passage why, that, he want, that he wanted us to operate in Phobos or Delia. He said, you lobby a godly fear, a reverential awe of God is the best definition. You, you're going to be... You're going to receive my grace. You're going to have such an impartation for me. You're going to be well-pleasing to me. I'm going to grace you, lavish upon you my grace. You're going to have my heart. You're going to serve me from there. And you're going to be in absolute awe of who I am. That's what the word means. You're going to be in absolute awe. I tell you, when you, when, when you get to that point and you're walking in that level of awe of God, you're not intimidated by the enemy anymore. Not in awe of him. You're not in awe of the storm. You're not in awe of the left. I love them. I lay my life down for them. But I hate what they're doing. There is a difference. I hate the evil. I love people. There is a difference. But I'm not in awe of what the enemy is doing. He will lose. He is the forever loser. Which translation is it that calls him that all the time? The message calls him the forever loser. God is the forever winner. You can sit under our promise tree all you want, but you will lose. It's our tree. Excuse me while I go find my sword. So I'm just preaching this message tonight to say to you, come on, suck it up. Get it right. Get your attitude right. We're going to win this thing. Right? We're going to win this. Our God can do this. And why wouldn't he do this? I look at sometimes the people don't argue with me. Well, where do you get your theology? What makes you think he wouldn't want to do this? That's what I say to do you not think he would want to save a billion people? Do you not think he would want to send revival to a generation because he loves them that much and he doesn't want them going to hell? Of course he's going to do this. He's building a kingdom that cannot be shaken. 